So it's really good to be here. Um, feels like this was one of the places where I first talked about nerves, I think 10 years ago. So um, I couldn't really think of a better talk to come after than Ricardo's and Omer. So thank you for the setup. So what, I'm, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about um, the beam. In, so it's running on nerves, but how we use it at the company that I work at. And for those of you who have attended my talks in the past, I'm, they're mostly technical. I talk about like what's new in nerves and all this. This one's totally different. This one I'm actually going to talk about how the company I work at um, uses nerves. And I've been holding off on doing this for the longest time until I had something actually interesting to share. And uh, you know, felt like things had been deployed to a scale where what I could actually say would uh, you know, have some um, more meaningful impact on how Elixir and the Beam and uh, Nerves work at scale. So topics, I'm going to talk a little bit about my, about my company and the device. Um, it's going to be this one. We make our own hardware. Um, and I'll show you the insides of this. Talk a little bit about the, our experiences developing on the Beam. And this is ranges all from like what we, what kind of processors we use to how um, new developers join the team, how they come up to speed with this. And then I'm going to totally diverge to another, um, to another topic, which uh, um, feels slightly off um, from the direction of that I wanted to take this talk initially. But I really want to mention some areas where we had trouble and the direction that we're going now. And I'm going to mention alarms. And I was realizing I'm going to be talking to a whole group of telecom people or a bunch of telecom people. So I'm probably going to find out. Um, well, uh, I, I'm going to find out, I may learn the hard way about the direction that we're going. <laughs> All right, so anyway, smart rent. Um, what do we do? What we do? Basically, anything that can be automated in a residential property, we try to have some solution for it. And so um, we, where we start was the smart home automation. And that's a lot of the things that Omer and Ricardo were talking about like with Home Assistant. So if you're familiar with Home Assistant, this would be the enterprise-y version of Home Assistant. Um, we do other things. So access control is kind of related, but different technologies. This is for like common, area, common areas like gyms or pool access, parking lots. And then there's just a lot of other stuff. And you can read more about these on our website that somehow um, we're, so, we're involved with making it easier for the property manager or the tenant to be able to interact with the different IoT devices in their buildings. All right, so how big is this? Um, we're in, at the time that these uh, were reported, we were in about 3,800 apartment communities, mostly in the United States. And what that, that equates to is about 700,000 homes. So when you see, um, smart rent devices think that you know the hardware that we've built has been in about that many um, apartments and individual use um, families use them. And that and then on the other side of that, so we have we're in the homes and there are a bunch of there's like smart door locks, smart thermostats, lights, other things. And if you add all those up, you get somewhere north of two million. So before anyone quotes things like the beams running on all of those. I want to be very clear, we have two IoT platforms at the company, which I think makes some of my experiences even more interesting because I can compare what it looks like on the JVM to what it looks like on the Beam a little bit. So right now, the JVM currently has more. The Beam is getting a lot. It's very significant how many we have, but it is split. The numbers are split. All right, so let's talk about some of the history here. Um, I know many of you may have heard of my company. Many of you may not. We have been slightly involved on the open source stuff, especially on the NERVS project and NERVS adjacent projects. So you may have seen, seen us there. Um, we sponsor the forum. We're an EF member. And uh, we're also a sponsor of this conference. So we're not trying to hide from this community. We're very invested in it. All right, so now I want to start talking about what we do. And I first need to get us on the same page on some vocabulary, because I'll say some words. And I want to make sure that uh, they aren't lost. Um, for one of the topics is thermostats. So how many of you have taken the thermostat off the wall? And all right, so this might be a really simple slide for our least lot of people. And I'm very grateful that. So the gist of the 
with the thermostat, it's connected to wires to your HVAC system. And I've separated these out left and right to, to show the HVAC system, the air conditioner, the heater, and then the little blower that comes in. And if you look behind the scenes in the, in the wall, there are a couple of wires that come out that supply power to the thermostat. And if you've hooked up a nest or whatever, you've seen these and you've had to connect it up. Um, then there are, there are other wires that control what the, that your HVAC unit does, and it's very simple. It's like you just have to connect the red wire to the green wire, and if you were, had an old timey thermostat, it'd be a switch. If you have a new, any kind of new thermostat now, it's a relay. And so the green wire goes to the fan, um, and you get the idea. There's white and yellow wires. And this is just one kind of thermostat, or one kind of HVAC system. There are quite a few variations on this, but for the purposes of this talk, if you hear me talk about relays to turn on different parts of the HVAC system, this is, this is the kind of idea. So the next thing that I wanted to cover is, is uh, smart home um, functionality. And I'm gonna guess Few of you have heard of Home Assistant, given that it was talked about in the previous talk. So, um, so this, let me tell you about the smart rent scenario, so you can get your um, head wrapped around some of the terms that we have. So we have a hub, so the gateway um, device that talks to all this, the uh, smart IoT appliances that you have, and that all is done through a protocol called Z-Wave. Uh, Z-Wave is a um, sub gigahertz protocol. It's lower power, so a lot of these devices, you know, like the locks and especially the leak sensors, they'll have batteries, leak sensors, you want them, their batteries to last a really long time because it, you really don't want to replace them. But it's the same idea with the door locks. And Z-Wave helps you out that. And Z-Wave also helps you by defining a consistent interface across vendors. So door locks kind of work the same between vendors. And lights kind of work the same. Um, and then we backhaul that to the internet, where if you are a resident, this is, uh, you can pull out your cell phone and do all the smart home things on your cell phone. Um, and there are a bunch of other interfaces that I'm not getting to in the slide. So this is the setup. Now, that the next part of this is, so you've seen that what happens inside the apartment. Now I want to show you the pieces that are outside the apartment to get, to get a feel for where things are. Um, first off, we use a program called Nerfs Hub. Nerfs Hub, we've, we've talked about this a little bit in previous talks, so I encourage you to go look there. But it's a firmware update server. So we have all these devices in the field. We need to, you know, things happen, features get added. Um, Nerfs Hub where coordinates the, firm, the scheduling of the firmware updates to go out to those devices. And then it also gives us a remote management interface to go through, like, get an IEX prompt for us so we can do some more debug or whatever. Um, on the more production side for uh, control, um, we, go, we connect with AWS IoT, so this is an MQTT broker, that the messages that get sent back and forth are stuff like unlock my door or turn on my lights, you know, things like that, and there's a whole lot of these. That goes to a component on our back end called Spartan Manager, which then supplies interfaces with a whole lot of things. And I just have a subset here. The most visible ones are our mobile apps. The um, less visible ones are all of our enterprise integrations, which I haven't shown. Um, Smart Rent Manager is in Elixir. So Nerfs Hub is in Elixir. The hub over there is also in Elixir. We use the Beam a whole lot. All right. So let's get to the main thing that I want to talk about, which is this device. So we actually have several devices in production. This is uh, one of the newer ones. So most of our devices are hub -like type devices, similar to what was shown in the previous talk. This one is also a thermostat. So um, the beam runs inside this. I'm gonna take it apart visually so you can see it. This is what looks like off, which is less interesting. So I got a picture to show what looks like on. The LEDs, so it looks all white, but there are LEDs behind here that show up and glow and do all the thermostat-like things. So you can kind of see it in action there. Okay, so there's, this part is hard to see. This would go on the wall. So if you've taken apart a thermostat, you'll have seen this part. And then if you want to take apart things further, so I don't know how many people are in SmartRent, 
apartment complexes, but those of you are, now that I'm gonna show you the inside so you don't need to take apart yours. <laughs> you all laugh, and yet this is something that I know some of you do. <laughs> so, so let's maybe take this apart in a safe area. Um, and here's the main, there's one PCB, this is two-sided. Just real quick, here's what the other side looks like with the LEDs that end up shining through the plastic. If you wanna see more closely what this looks like, just come get me later. So let's go through. The, the, main, the main side that has all the interesting parts. And the first part is the processor. So we primarily um, deploy 32-bit ARM processors. Um, this one happens to be a quad core. There are a lot of things that go into picking a processor, some is which ones that you can buy. We downclock it as low as we can, this processor supports in an easy way. I think you probably could make it even go slower, but 480 megahertz is kind of the happy area. Um, why do we downclock it? Number one, the beam runs really well, even when it's slow. And this is not exactly slow, but compared to what most of you run your laptops at, this would be, this is pretty, um, this would be pretty slow. The uh, other part is, is that this is a thermostat. One of the key features in a thermostat is to measure the ambient temperature. We're not really too keen in warming up the thermostat a lot for measuring the temperature. <laughs> All right, so memory. Uh, memory is another place where there are sweet spots. So on the DRAM, uh, we have 256 meg. Um, when you look at our memory usage, we're at about 128-ish. Um, so we use about half of it. Uh, I think we don't use swap. I've never, I don't think anyone on the team has ever optimized for memory. We haven't tried. So this is like a, a level of memory that we don't have to try at. The flash part, this four gig, um, Flash part that we have on here is another one of convenience. This is the part that we can buy. Our firmware images are about 30 megabytes. So we have, we have, um, we do the AB slot thing with nerves and we just have lots of room just to, I don't know, just to leave vacant just in case something comes up where we might want to do some big experiment. Oh, let's see here, are the wall plate connectors for connecting it to the back. Uh, temperature humidity sensor, this is something that I think could have a whole talk on, how do you get ambient room temperature inside a little box that generates heat and all the other things. Um, suffice it to say, you don't put this thing on the main PCB. So there's a little um, connector on there to t that goes to a ribbon cable, which I'm not showing, that goes to a nice little pocket for it. And there's even more. So the, um, now for radios. Um, we have four radios on this device. Um, the the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth radio is right there, so you can see the little antenna. Um, on this other side, Z-Wave, so I'm not showing our, our thread antenna, I'm not showing, but uh, the, we mostly use Z-Wave for this talk, so I'm gonna talk about that one. It's over here, you can see it's a little bit bigger antenna because it's sub-gigahertz. And then we have a cell um, modem at the bottom, and you can see it's Two, um, two antennas there. Um, we, the other thing that you're not seeing on here is that there's a wired ethernet. We have three ways of getting to the internet that are potentially possible. It depends on how things get wired up. Believe it or not, some people have wired ethernet to their thermostats, so that obviously would be a cool thing. Um, but for the most part, it's cellular and Wi-Fi that we swap between. And the last big thing up here is the real-time clock. So when power, when power goes out, we still know what date it is when we turn on immediately. So this is, so this is it. Um, if you want to see this closer, come get me afterwards. I'll show you that. So I'm going to move on to the software that's running on this thing. Um, at the base level, we use nerves. I think everyone kind of knew that. I, this is not to scale, but this is a good way to kind of think about this. We have a lot of business rules, other kind of hub management things. I have just put them all in the smallest rectangle there because they're not stuff that, that is super interesting. Um, it's super interesting to us as we deploy this, and I think a lot of you have business rules and stuff, but it's not super interesting to talk about in, in a conference talk. I'll talk about the things around it. So the um, user interface, we go to the LEDs, there's a constant current driver, that over I squared C that we can talk to and we have like a little module that knows how to do the little LED things. Um, the HVAC control, HVAC control is mostly 
taking the temperature, reacting to it, switching relays that turn things on or off. Um, that is a very interesting part, but you can kind of think it's a big, uh, that's a piece of Elixir code that interacts with the relays and receives these temperature measurements and, and uh, it exists in itself separately. The Z-Wave piece is quite a large piece. There's an open source project that we have called Grizzly, which you can look up to do Z-Wave things. Um, the MQTT side, let's see, tor we use an open source project called Tortoise to do that. Um, firmware updates, Nerves Hub Link, and uh, the networking side is, is, if you've ever done networking on these devices, it's, there are a lot of details, and VintageNet takes care of a whole lot of those for you, and one of those is just switching between which is the active network interface, but uh, when you deploy these things, why do you have to, there are a lot of ways people like to set up their networks, and it kind of glosses over, you know, lets you, lets you kind of operate at a higher level um, with setting these things up, and we use that. And then there's another piece that we use is Phoenix. We have Phoenix running inside this, and I want to reiterate, 30 megs is our firmware size, so I, this kind of makes me happy. We have, our, our Phoenix little web server has some pictures in it, which I'm always telling the person who writes our little local UI, and this is mostly for diagnostics, this isn't for inside the, um, for our main use, so that, you know, make your pictures a little bit smaller, because we're like sending them over the LTE links all the time to lots of hubs, and, the last part is that I'm going to talk a little bit more about is how we keep units online. Um, we may not have like the most life critical device, but we still have a lot of issues with we need to keep this thing online and working. We do control some pretty important things in your house, and, so, and it's not really viable for us to send someone out every time you can't, um, something goes wrong. All right, so with that, I think I've given like a high level overview of software and hardware that we built. So I want to give some experiences that we've had. And these are very high level. Um, I, and I, sh I want to stress that I share some of, even some of the negative things I say, I, stray this, I, I, I share these in, in an attempt to be um, positive and maybe elicit some help in addressing some of these. Or maybe um, some people could, could share their experiences and how they got over, um, got over them. So first, successes. And uh, the, I don't have a big team. Like SmartRent is not a big team of developers. And I think a lot of people that program Elixir have found, in Erlang have found that small teams can do a lot. And I can share that with everyone that we have, oh, I think five in production hardware projects that have kind of decent stacks on them. Um, and a lot of stuff happening, and on each of the, on, we have nine people total, and we kind of split off, and there's like four in each. So it's not big, we're not a big group at all. Um, and in fact, we're not only not a big group, we also hire a lot of people who are new to embedded. So um, the, I, I just want to point out one observation for like a lot of embedded devices. It's like, like ours and like a lot of other ones, it's, sometimes it's controlling relays. Sometimes it's turning lights on. It's, a lot of this stuff is not rocket science on the hardware side. A lot of this stuff is very accessible to anyone. And then on top of that, the majority of the software that we write is on the other side, not the low-level hardware. It's all the other management controls, communications, all that stuff. So in some sense, Picking a language like Elixir makes a lot of sense because it is so much conducive to the majority of stuff that you write. It, it almost feels silly to pick a programming language for like C or something like that. That's really great for maybe switching relays or lights, but can you imagine like writing everything in it? Um, just moving on. We've had a great experience with open source. I'm pretty tied to the community, but I could say that like for other developers on the team, we've gotten amazing responses when we've had trouble. Um, just recently, we ran into a problem when we switched to Bandit, and a big, that, was, that turns out that was just came up because of some of the scale that we had in, in hitting one of our servers. Um, on, 
that we had and Metrodel just jumped in, a few others just jumped in and it was like a legit hard problem that was fixed. Um, and I can say that I have multiple of those that I could repeat to people. Um, and then I, I always have to add this. The, the automatic healing that you find in the beam is like such a lifesaver. So I think this is one thing that I didn't believe whenever I heard this coming in to the community about how people loved like gen servers crashing and restarting. But shoot, when this stuff happens on Friday night, like it's really, and you see that the device is totally fine and the person's unaffected and you can just wait till next week, like this, this adds up. All right, so, all right, that was, that was like the, the happy stuff I had to share. The challenges, and I, I'd say the challenges are more on bringing people up to speed. And this is, this is somewhat a nerves thing um, versus, um, I've noticed with some other language, some other parts of the Elixir community, especially like Phoenix, you can get, you can get by more without delving deep into gen server and supervision trees and all this. But with nerves, you're really just thrown into it. There's a whole lot of this. And I know I'm speaking to a lot of people who are used to this, but suffice it to say, this is kind of a, a learning curve issue. And I don't think I've cracked the nut on how to like, get people comfortable with designing supervision trees and imagining how the whole system fails and recovers. Um, the, uh, and so on the next part, this, this poor abstractions. So uh, I think this is any language. Um, and I think that the trouble that I have a little bit more on the hardware side or that, that we have at SmartRent is that the number of examples for the kinds of domain that we have are so heavily Python, C, C++, and the default way of constructing a library or some sort of interface to this is to follow the patterns that come from those. And those are like the absolute worst patterns in hindsight. <laughs> I mean, they work at the beginning, but then, and, and so you're like, okay, it works, I got a deadline, let's ship it, and then you know, we work on this, you know, a couple months later we had feature knowledge and then we really start hitting the fact that the functional paradigms really would benefit in some of this stuff and then we eventually have to rewrite a piece of code that uh, we didn't really want to do at that time. All right, so high level stuff. So next, uh, I wanna get into some of the ways that we debug um, to see how much this matches with others. Um, we are still very much log driven. I don't know how much you, you all are log driven. I always keep on, keep on thinking that we'll graduate to a lot of the more fancy ways, but uh, by and large, um, we go on device. Ring logger is, the, is, is a tool to be able to log these, keep log messages stored in a circular buffer in memory, which is convenient. And so people watch that or review past logs. Um, our use of hot code reload, copy paste def modules. I used to be sad about this and I am no longer sad. I'm just <laughs> totally gonna own up to this thing as being the best thing since sliced bread. So you all can quote me on that. Like this hot code feature, like being able to copy paste the def module in to fix something in the field just to try something is, is the best ever. Um, and maybe it's just where I'm coming from on the embedded, but being able to change lines of code at a fine grain with like literally no effort is both I guess kind of scary, but also get, get, gets us out of tons of troubles. Makes things so much easier. Um, Relaying tracing, we use that intermittently. I'm really looking forward to OTP 27 with the multiple sessions. Uh, I think that's gonna totally change things for us. Because, uh, um, and just to expand on this a little bit, is having helpers you know, set up traces is kind of nice, but then having traces overlap each other with the because everything's kind of in a global session is less nice. So I'm looking forward to experimenting with this. Uh, next one, telemetry. We tried using telemetry. I could talk a lot about this. We have an open source library called Mobius where you can look at our temp. So the challenge with telemetry on our devices is that while we are interested in the data, we can't just start feeding up from every hub to some server to record this. It's just financially not possible. So with with Mobius, what we try to do is keep a circular log, um, kind of like, like Ring Logger does, um, but it, 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 uh, it logs at different um, time, step, time scales, so the, some data is lost if you don't check it. But if you do want to check it, you could get like a big bundle of all the telemetry that has happened for the past month where it's very fine-grained, close in time to where you're at, and less fine-grained farther away. 
that turned out to be a lot of work, and then we kept on figuring out ways to avoid using telemetry, so we put that on the back burner. Um, last one, crash reporting sentry. The only thing I have right now is that when we, when we were, had small deployments, sentry was fine, you know, who cares, you know, we're not gonna spend a lot of money on it, um, but then we're like, well, should we expand to a large deployment because when you have LTE connected devices, you pay, like there's a quota. So, I mean, if all of a sudden one of us messed up some gen server and kept on spinning and reporting bad things, um, the bean counters would definitely notice. Uh, we have since found out that that just hasn't been happening for us. So um, we have a lot of protections to avoid um, Sentry um, using up LTE bills, but uh, that's, that hasn't been the issue. The, the devices that tend to to spam a lot have been due to really wild things happening on Wi-Fi and wired networks that we never, I never ever would have anticipated. And by and large, we've worked past those, I hope, knock on wood. All right, so high level. Now I wanna kinda change things around, and this is where I talk a little bit with trepidation, um, but I'm excited. So I want to talk a little bit about software resilience. So as I was leading to, keeping devices up and online so we can remote debug them is so hugely important. And so what are things involved with this? Well, fault detection, redundancy, um, redundancy being you know we have multiple network connections, there's some other areas that could be redundant. Um, automated remediation, this is kind of the key. We really like faults detected or to be detected locally on device and have code that automatically remediates um, that problem. If that doesn't work, then we want to make sure that's still possible to do remote remediation. And if that doesn't work, of course, we're, we have to fall back to on-site, which is expensive and undesirable for many reasons. If you can imagine yourself going to someone's apartment who lives there, that is awkward at best, but a lot of times the solutions are reboot. It's, I'm sure people are familiar with that. So let's talk about a little bit more about audio remediation. I think you all know about, you do this already. You make a TCP connection web server. You, you retry, right? This is not rocket science here. We, hit, we have gen servers. We hook them up to a supervision tree. The gen servers crash. They retry. The remediation is to restart it. The, uh, not rocket science at all. We're very used to this. Beam is like totally great at this. The, the next step down is Erlang's heart process, which I think is medium used, I, I hope, but this is like what happens if the beam hangs, right? Heart detects that. And then on, on a hardware project, what happens if the hardware as a whole or something outside of the beam's control hangs or becomes not okay? That you have a hardware watchdog. Um, and then the the, the, the next area that I'm gonna talk about a little bit is what we're doing with alarm handlers and how we got there. So let's talk about the hardware watchdog. So hardware watchdog, very simple electronic circuit. So in order to make things reliable, you know, keeping things simple is a very good strategy. So hardware watchdog, you put a little electronic component and it basically says, it, it, it has one input, which is, is an I'm okay input. So the CPU has to say I'm okay, some software. And as long as it keeps on hearing that it's okay, it's, it's, it doesn't do anything. But as soon as it doesn't, it, as soon as a timeout has happened where the system's not okay, it resets everything. So just total reboot. So get out of trouble at a very low level hardware way. So what we do with Nerf's heart is we use Nerf's heart to pet the heart word watchdog. So as long as heart's okay, this is Erlang's heart, the, the, just with the nerves enhancements. As long as, uh, as, as Erlang's okay, the watchdog's gonna be okay. And so you can see here, Erlang BM has to check in. I just made up random numbers. There are a lot of defaults here, um, but uh, Nerf's heart will figure it out. And then, well, you know, this seems like a good concept, right? So let me get my application involved. So if I want to know that everything's okay, why not just bubble it up to my application? There's an API call called heart, set callback, that gives you module name and, and, and function, to, and, and the application can say it's okay. So we do that, right? Like, why wouldn't we? Um, 
then uh, let's see, you can also communicate with it. So there's a little bi-directional communication that can happen. So this works great. I was gonna tell you like the war stories and then realized I was short on time. Um, so I'm just gonna give you the summary here, <laughs> which is that this code is amazingly hard to maintain. And here, I will, I will help you see why. We started building infrastructure to say what it means to be I'm okay. Um, and it turns out that figuring out whether you're okay is like very hard because some errors are transient and rebooting just after a minute or something like that is like totally the wrong thing. Can you imagine your thermostat rebooting when your network's out? Like this is, this is not good at all. You want to have more smarts in how you trigger this uh, set callback. Um, both from a granularity side and also the, the, the one thing that set callback doesn't, I mean, it, it's very explicit. So now I'm kind of feeling silly about this, but um, if you return anything but okay, you fail, right? No surprise there. If you raise an exception, you fail. Well, exceptions are unbelievably to act, easy to accidentally raise when you call through Elixir and Erlang code just because you code for the happy path, right? Um, the other thing is if it takes you too long, you fail. And like the time that this gen server is waiting for something else and it happens to be four seconds and then followed by the one that's two seconds or 30 seconds above that, all of a sudden the timeouts are too long for this callback and then the fail means reboot immediately. So it's brutal. All the code was layered with all these defensive cases. It was large. I want, we wanted to figure out some way to encapsulate this in a nice way and it just didn't happen. So, new strategy time. We're going to simplify this to be just a Boolean, like I'm okay, you're okay, so, um, but it's gonna be set differently. Um, so I'm gonna hope to make this more clear that the, the I'm okay check is, 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 is gonna be just pulling this thing that, that just is, um, just represents the, the, that things are generally healthy and you don't need a reboot or anything to get to it. And if that thing doesn't get updated, then well, there's probably another problem because it should be live. But we're gonna reduce that code to something simpler and decouple everything else. And now I'm gonna talk about alarm and alarm handlers, which this is why I was a little bit concerned because alarms, talking about alarms, is something that's been OTP for like literally ever. and for reasons that I couldn't completely figure it out. It's, they've been falling out of, it doesn't seem like a lot of people use them. And while it's there and there's a lot of information out there, I want to maybe start up the conversation again because I think that this is a promising thing, um, feature for, um, for what we do at SmartRent and also um, getting some, hearing some more feedback for like what things went wrong would be insanely useful. Um, so just a, Cap that for those of you who haven't seen the alarm stuff in OTP, this is in the SASL library. So alarm, high level, is just a Boolean state that says some condition is happening. It's stateful, um, you know, you, a lot of people think of these as similar to events, but events are transient. You can send the event, like something happened or something changed state. This is like, this is now in this state, like Wi-Fi is down. Um, Wi-Fi is up, so the events either, or the alarm's either set or cleared. Um, if you're an alarm producer, it's totally easy. You call one of these two functions to give things, to give the update. If you're a consumer of the alarms, well, that's when you have to do more work. That's where you really have to find another library because Cecil just, Cecil will save what alarms are set for, but it's, so simplistic that it's not really useful. You need to swap it out with a real alarm handler that lets you actually subscribe to alarms or query them, do deep duplication, all these other niceties that you want to have. So high level for what you have. So now I want to kind of go back and throw th show through some examples because I think that you can kind of get a feel in the back of your head. I'm like, okay, my networking stack's going to say, set you know, Wi-Fi down, Wi-Fi up, and then I'm gonna have some remediation code listen to it. And that's what I'm gonna show right here. Um, I think I did the event way first. If you get the event down, then bam, use cellular, like nothing there. But you know, the problem here is you can miss events. Like gen servers can restart for the remediation code. There are so many ways 
to, that you can miss events. So having something stateful is nice. So I know you can build this with event systems. Totally fine. Let's just call it alarms. We alarm set it. Um, go to the, re the cellular remediation. All right. So this is good. Um, so we were, we switched to cellular, and then you know at some time Wi-Fi is going to be back, and then you know you clear the alarm, and hopefully you can kind of see where I'm going. What's the remediation for clearing the alarm? Well, we want to use Wi-Fi again. So great, right? But this doesn't really work in the real world that well um, because Wi-Fi and like a lot of alarm producers tend to be flaky. Like there's a time component here is that there's like Wi-Fi can think that it's up and ready, but it's not really up. So how much time do you give? So I'm going to try to simulate this here saying that, you know, Wi-Fi is, Wi-Fi goes quick down. I don't think I could do the animation. Um, right for this, but just say it's like flopping up and down. So then what do we do? Well, we want to say, okay, Wi-Fi is up, so we clear the alarm, but maybe we don't wait to clear the alarm until it's been up for a little bit longer, or maybe in our remediation code, maybe we just check for when it goes back and set a timer. And before you know it, you start typing out a lot of code in your remediation code or your alarm sets, and it's not related to this. These are more like how much do I care about as an app to for how long um, I want Wi-Fi to wait in my application. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to introduce a new alarm, and this is going to be a, a synthetic one that uh, keeps track, holds an alarm for a little bit of time. So this is this is going to be the penalty box, the Wi-Fi penalty box alarm. And as soon as the you, when alarms are set. When the Wi-Fi is down, alarm set, it's going to be moved to the penalty box. Um, when it's cleared, well, the penalty box alarm won't clear immediately. It will, but it will eventually clear. And, uh, and I guess I didn't show it eventually clear. Um, yeah, let me get back to this picture. It it will eventually clear, and then we'll use Wi-Fi again. Um, and you go through this process and you kind of have a flow for how things, for, for how alarms are set. Um, and you keep on coming up with new, more conditions on each of these. And they end up littering your remediation code or your alarm setting code with a lot of actual lines of code that are really hard to test. So separating things out in kind of a data flow is the direction we've been going. And this is just like, I, I wasn't even going to go over this example, but it's even worse than this when you start mapping out all the little conditions that we have seen in the field that where if we want something to automatically remediate for, for picking which connection, there, in order to, to give a good experience for using the device, we have to be kind of smart on this. But we want to be smart in a very controlled way. Um, and making it visible through these block diagrams is kind of helpful in communicating around the team how this works. So this is where I'm going to introduce this alarmist library. So this is an open source library. You can get it. Um, we, post, we posted it on here. I'll get that one on there. We posted it on GitHub. You can review it. It's, I would definitely say it's early stages. Kind of goes through our ideas on how to, um, how to, how to model these alarms and create these synthetic alarms. Um, to, to help represent what happens. Um, so let me just give a little teaser for what things look like. So this is Elixir code. The way we name alarms is, is using Elixir module names. And then we have this, this macro to help us build up the condition. And roughly, you can kind of see that there is another, there are a couple input alarms, alarm one, alarm two, and then the flaky alarm. The, the most interesting of these is the flaky alarm, and there's an intensity function. This is kind of like the, the supervision intensity. Like, so if flaky alarm goes up and down five times in 10,000 milliseconds, 10 seconds, then that part becomes true. And then the Boolean logic follows for the other alarms. So when that whole statement is true, intensity threshold alarm gets set. And when it's not true, it gets cleared. And hypothetically, a remediation could be based off that which the remediation code could just focus on what it does. And then the code that produces the alarms, like alarm one, alarm two, and flaky alarm, can just focus on what they do. And kind of the complexity of combining and composing everything is set up to be in a, a small statement like this. Um, I'm very much looking for feedback on alarm, 
on alarms and alarm handlers. We've been playing around with this for a while, and it deletes a lot of code and makes us happy. But you know, next year I could come back and say that I that I found this other um, problem, like with with the way we went the direction of heart. So, so at any rate, I really want to underscore Beams worked really well for us. Our use case it has it maps a lot to the strengths to the beam. It works well for our team. Um, we're deploying this in a very big way, um, and I'm very excited about you know, continuing down this path. Um, very happy that it's working out the way that it is. And, and you know, this really isn't a nurse talk. This is like a whole ecosystem talk. So um, very happy with the rest of the stuff um, that's going on. Um, uh, in here, I often hear from people, do you still use 32-bit processors? Yes, <laughs> still use it, very much like it. <laughs> and um, do I, will I get to always use them? I don't know, but um, if, if I want to throw this out there, that they're very viable. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, you know, the, the, the big things about Erlang and OTP that we found is that there are just a lot of tools for making kind of these kind of system, style systems, which were even talked about in Ricardo and Omer's talk. And I want to um, look a little bit more into local alarm handling because I kind of feel like maybe it's been, been not looked at for a while. So at any rate. That's my talk, so thanks to everyone. <laughs>